Thank you, Martin, for your warm words. <laughs> it's a real pleasure each time. Thank you. I thank you for your hard work on helping the Angular team with Webpack 5. It's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Stepan is stepping away uh, instead of doing an introduction, or we should just start a presentation right away. Yes, please. I think we it's it's it should be somewhere in twelve minutes, but I think we can we can start it now. That's okay. If you're okay. ready. Sure, always. So uh, as for today's presentation, um, I would love to discuss a very interesting topic for me personally, additional to of course model fluoration, which I was uh, spending quite a lot of time lately. Uh, the other one is Composition API, and it's really heavily related to uh, obviously what I do and where I'm involved uh, as a creator of a company, which is Valor Software, which mostly Angular uh, development workshop, uh, and GX Bootstrap as a uh, library, uh, UI library for Angular, and Talk CEO as a conference organizer, uh, for some reason, Google Developer Expert, hopefully for a good one. And you can find me on any uh, any social media or whatever is working everywhere. And before jumping into diving into the topic, I would love to introduce uh, the problem as uh, a way we do introduction for our uh, task in our work. So uh, the problem is that our components eventually became quite huge one and. It's always a good question why components became huge. So, and to think if we think about it a bit, we will understand that the only persistent thing we have in our work is a change. Whatever we develop, whatever we do, uh, we always gather requirements, we always, always plan how perfect will be our small and shiny component. And at the end of the day, it's usually became a huge monster which you have to live with change with and new fixes and so on and so on and unfortunately nobody gives a second chance or an option for a second thought about how to do that right how to refactor it so and even reusable components which sounds as a good option to quit this hell eventually uh, face the same fate that you uh, developing a reusable component, then you add additional features and fixes, and those became huge and monstrous, unfortunately. But the worst part about the reusable component that, and comparing to regular components or component containers, uh, they're even more limited about their knowledge of the context they will be used in. So they have to all the time add new inputs and new outputs. And not only uh, the implementation becomes larger, but the API surface of our components became huge and hard to comprehend by the developers. So the process of trying to, or actually trying to reduce the complexity of those components is a tame and application complexity, like in general. And this is not just Angular related. There are a lot of uh, ways to tame your application complexity, of course. Uh, we will cover some of those uh, because it's a huge topic. And only to cover all of those, we'll have to spend several hours just to list those, all, all of them. Um, but there are some older, there are some that are newer concepts. There are a reason why it's called Angular Ivan Composition API. So we'll name the older one and We'll discuss in more detail uh, pro approaches which became more easily available with Angular Ivy. Uh, to clearly understand the need of the composition approaches, we need to get an overview of these approaches. And uh, I would love to have a special thanks word to the V3 composition API uh, request for comments, which was happening around a year ago. And of course, I would not go fully with that approach, but it has really some really cool ideas and thoughts which it took into Angular world and would love to use my own and to share with you. So could be will save you some time and nerve cells. As of goal of what we're 
trying to achieve here, right? Uh, of course, uh, we write in code not for our computers. We developers write code for other developers or to ourselves in the future. So, and readable as non functional requirement to your components or application implementation is quite an important thing to do because you're not working in isolation. Your teammates should be able to help on and continue to work with it. As a maintainable code, uh, it's how easy to fix or enhance existing code. Or obviously, small and isolated chunks of code is much easier to maintain rather than huge and overcomplicated code. And also extensible, obviously, how easy you're able to plug in new features to it. So all of that sounds familiar because it's mostly parts of the solid uh, principle. So as of code reuse practices, which you most likely know already. Base classes, abstract or not. Obviously, you did or have seen those. Services is a go-to solution for any Angular application. Content projection or ng templates, whatsoever. Any ways to use templates, which is a part of the component, or the component itself, or uh, nest components in some other ways, especially when you develop a reusable components. Global state management like NGRX, NGXX, Akita, Mobix, Redux, whatsoever. Plenty of ways you have heard of it for sure. Mixings and higher order components uh, was around for a while, especially in like uh, other UI libraries, uh, but became much easier to use in Angular starting with Ivy. And of course, the topic of this uh, presentation is a composition API. What we have on our plate at the end of the day, um, of course, there are much more to discuss, but whatever approach you choose, you, there are no silver bullet, let's be clear. Uh, you always can end up with macaroni monster, which is waiting for you somewhere behind. So, mixings. Um, is a class that contains method uh, for use by other classes uh, without having to be the parent class of those other classes. Sounds like prep thing, but uh, if you will take a look on the top function of this uh, sample, you will see that you're actually able to call this function and it will have a new class inside of it and it will create a new class and will extended with additional methods or properties. So, sounds about right as a good idea, right? But while uh, mixins is quite a new uh, approach for Angular community, it's uh, quite a lot uh, for a long time around, and especially for React developers, it even became an anti-pattern somewhere around four years ago. So we should have some fun with it and move forward because uh, there are plenty of pros and cons which we'll discuss later. But have to mention one more approach of the mixings uh, with helper functions to mix static classes when you don't uh, actually do all of that dynamic extension of the classes uh, one by one as a function. So. Let's discuss, we'll, back, we'll get back to the uh, mixins later on, but in general, mixin has a real good pros, and uh, one of those is code organized by feature, which is something we would love to have. Uh, reduced repetitive code, which is a great thing too, but on the bad part, there are name conflicts prone, because you never know which mixins add which properties. And obviously, you have implicit properties and dependencies, and you don't know how those mixins could interact between each other because they just simply overwrite all of the things we just have. So, uh, if you need to review that mixin in some different scenario, you can have an issue with that. As a successor of the mixins, higher order functions and uh, components take place on the stage. And we should understand this is a very powerful concept and brings a lot of interesting options to the plate. Uh, but if you will take a 
closer look on this skull temple, you will see some tetas. I'm not sure that uh, my mouse is visible here, but if you take a look on const original factory equals component type dot data factory, then you have component type dot theta component dot factory, which is both using per Angular private API. Those APIs for years up there, but still doesn't sound about right uh, to be used in production, but still a way to do those things. So uh, on, you have, of course, should uh, think about it if you have some restriction about using private APIs in production or not, like me. Um, they serve the same reason as a mix uh, but do it in a more major way. So if to, if to speak of like hardware components, they obviously create properties and implicit dependency if they need to. They mutate original component. Uh, they should not do that. Uh, or they will be just a mixing uh, implemented in a different way. What they should do, uh, they should be adding additional uh, behavior to the component. So they could be applied to one or many components, right? And the good thing to have but they should not modify component. They should extend it. So they should not override existing properties or methods, which is hard to get actually. And the fun part about it, that components compared to mixings, which are, became in the part of the components, higher components should extend, but the component itself uh, should be, you should be able to use that component with or without harder component. Okay, so if a high order component will introduce a property and that property used in template, then you're not able to use that component without your high order component wrapper, which is kind of obvious thing. So on the good side, they have same pros and positive things as a mixing, code organized by feature, reduced repetitive code, lesser cons. So again, it's name conflict prone. And again, you can have implicit properties and dependencies which is could lead to some weird consequences. And we came to the composition API, which is the topic of our conversation. And unfortunately, it is not able to exist on its own. So it could be in some options if you go with power function or other implementation. Uh, if you wish to take a look on something like clear view three uh, composition API and Angular, there are Pretty nice library, which is ng effects. Uh, but it is, uh, if you're planning to use it on your projects, so that requires quite a mind shift from how you usually do things, things in Angular. And uh, not only you will have to learn it, all of your team have to learn it. So it's actually a hard way to start using composition API. So, as we know, all the old bad parts about the mixings, hardware components, and some other code reusable things, what are our key motivations for uh, in our composition API? What we want to should achieve? Like, we should have explicit properties, dependencies, uh, full or partial logic reuse, right? Organize it code by features and reuse boilerplate code, which is a lot usually. As of component state, uh, there are quite interesting idea that whenever you develop your Angular components uh, and you have some observable, which is then used in template, it's something like doing something unnatural to your HTML. Basically, HTML is a snapshot at any given moment of time. So trying to combine, I think, nature of the Angular application or user behavior uh, with static nature of uh, the HTML itself, it's always good reason for performance issues or even just any code issues. Other thing which is happens a lot in any libraries or frameworks on UI right now because they load too much is uh, that developers is able to trigger functions from HTML to, for example, calculate some property, which is again, hits performance. So like to sum up, I would love to improve rendering performance in general. So uh, let's start with a sample. 
how like let's move by some example and trying to apply those ideas one by one to whatever we want to achieve and we will pick up one component basically any component you will find in, in a real application or libraries you will see that it's one component but many mixed features inside of it so and what we will try to achieve and how we will gonna split it uh, logically independent parts which we can split out uh, often on which promises is often or uh, readily modified model with vs view logic or model vs platform logic and we will take a look on this um, thing this is material checkbox component it only 500 lines of code and this is one of the simplest components of the material ui library uh, i honestly tried to make the screenshot less ugly but as you could see i have failed miserably about it so on that uh, that screenshot contains only inputs and outputs and it's not even ever ever everything it had so it's kind of complicated to just go there open that component and comprehend what is happening inside of that component it, it, imagine you have to enhance and fix it or add an additional kind of feature to this component it could be quite challenging right so let's start with something simple and speak about inputs and outputs what it is how we use that and what does that mean so inputs and outputs this is our api of the components right this is our documentation this is our contract of communication we promise to developers who consume our components and if we will split that those two pages of screenshots into some comprehensible parts uh, you will see there are not many things new to you which you would would be able to understand much easier and never read it again if it would be uh, split into some smaller parts for example global element identifier uh, it's written once and you will forget about it. you will never read it again for a good reason uh, then you have accessibility attributes which does not change often correspond to uh, i would say standard so you write this once you don't want to see it each time you actually modify your component and it's a rarely modified thing as of uh, inputs which could affect or will affect the behavior of uh, this checkbox component obviously input api which is one to one to input checkbox uh, checkbox attributes basically if you know how input checkbox works in html you will take a look on this screenshot you will see the same names of this class and you will see the same names used in, for example mozilla documentation you don't even read have to read the documentation here uh, behavior of checkbox should correspond to input checkbox attributes that's kind of something we would expect if anybody of you was developing components which has to work with uh, angular forms you know that you have to implement control value accessor and as all of you know it takes good 50 to 70 lines of code to write a code you will have a joy of watching each time but you will never change it again if you will if you're writing several components which has to integrate with forms you will be most likely copy pasting your implementation of control value accessor everybody does it so nothing to be ashamed of and here we came to the attributes which actually make our material checkbox component unique that's actually something you should know on top of uh, basic input checkbox element that's something which makes it special and here we see only one input and a couple of outputs where actually change could be uh counted as um, almost a native event so how hard would be to comprehend uh, if you would know that you need only to understand these three additional fields to what you have already known from html 
And uh, this is where we will work, and this is what we will change in order to enhance or add additional feature to our component. You don't have to see everything else, just this part. And this is your work table. Uh, this is your properties which you will use and template. This will change most often. So, and that's fine. So, now let's build our shiny checkbox, which perfectly implements just one thing. And here we go again. <laughs> just kidding. So, that's fine. Uh, of course, there are other options how we can combine all of those parts of API. That's something, as I said, that there are another approach to the mixings. And you are able to mix all of those properties together. And you could say, uh -huh, again, we have implicit properties. But I would say you don't care, because those are just static properties. And in worst case, what you will have is some property types will not match each other. Then you need to mixture from a different component classes. Okay, uh, Nothing bad will happen, because they not yet have any functionality inside of that. So. Just by mixing classes with only static properties, you're solving quite a lot of things. Uh, no implicit dependencies, no implicit interactions, easy to reuse, and name clashing is not helpful. Of course, there are known issues which had to be solved somehow, like decorated inheritance not always works properties of now. And on some on some samples, you will see that I use empty directive attribute uh, as a hack because Angular uh, says that you're able to use uh, like input annotation only on uh, something which has meaning in Angular, like directive or component. And directive could be empty, so that's fine, because if you use Angular material, they use those hacks. So most likely, you use those hacks in production already, too. So nothing bad will happen, or should not, at least. So other point which uh, makes us one step closer is observable lifecycle events, which most likely some of you could use as especially for uh, engine destroy. But let's take one step further. And this one actually is in particular important for a grouping features in the code, because uh, if you have only methods uh, of lifecycle in your main component, reuse those in uh, parts of your component which you want to combine, it will be incredibly hard to just push those events. So your features should know about life cycle events, of course. So uh, here we can see how it usually looks, right? We have our component, we have our several interfaces we implement, and we see that there are uh, some subscribe, subscribe, additional properties. And that's what happens all the time. But what if we will introduce some observable lifecycle events? So uh, we can unite all of this functionality, split it not by some predefined methods. Like our feature is split into three uh, methods. And those methods, if you have a couple of features in one component, obviously those methods will have a part of the features in each of those, which could be annoying eventually. And here we can take a look like if we have observables, lifecycle events, we can even await for it's this code actually works, just in case. Uh, you can even await for something which happens once, like only need after content in it. Right, and you can destroy uh, whatever you don't need to unsubscribe after on on destroy, which looks pretty neat in one place, and uh, you don't have to create additional properties on your component in order to unsubscribe eventually. And this is one of the things in uh, composition uh, request for comments in comp uh, in view three which actually made it real deep impression on me. This simple idea, uh, different colors here means different feature inside of one component. And this picture show that there are a good goal for developers to actually group features 
in one place, not to split them across the component, which makes it real hard to comprehend and eventually to change. And as far as we remember, change, change always happens. So as soon as we're able to flatten sp our spaghetti code as some kind of lasagna up here, uh, and one of the options which actually allows us to do is observable lifecycle hooks, hooks, because that's something from the core which uh, pushing us to mix feature parts of the features and do all of this funny thing. So the functional split, we discussed uh, split of the API. We discussed observable lifecycle events. Now uh, the best part is functional split. I would say the hardest one. And we will briefly discuss some of the options we have uh, for functional split per features. And of course, uh, here I thought that should some kind of representation of the services, for example. But whatever like screen I would have that would be not representative, or for example, Angular material to complete just you know 1,500 lines of code. So it's like easy peasy to maintain for sure. It's in one file and has some services additionally in order to handle all that funny thing and utilities and base classes. So enjoy. But obviously, that's kind of, that's not, doesn't mean that's a bad code. That's code written in the terms how we get used to do those things. Uh, and we are still complaining about jQuery files for the same amount of lines, which has actually a better. Uh, you know, group in the features. Obviously, service is a good option, but linking usage of those services to component state is still responsibility of the component and template. And this leads to a huge amount of the boilerplate code. Uh, one more honorable mention is to NGX component state, which was released around three months ago. Uh, I would say that in NGX Bootstrap, I, we use that for around three and a half years already. Uh, we have much lesser implementation on our photo lines of code, which allows us to use uh, effects, actions, uh, reducers, and stuff. But without all of this, like fancy things in documentation, of course. But still, in Rick's component store is something you should take a look if you want, especially, for example, for module federation, if you want to have a component which is able to self manage its state and don't share it, because in Jurex store has a state management uh, with a root for application. Uh, while NGX component store has a root in your component. So each instance of your component will have independent state, which is nice to have. This is a sample of the code from NGFX, which I was mentioning before. This one-to-one -one implementation of uh, this view composition API RFC, which like if to take a look, like reference to zero is like subject of a number, right? React reactive is the same thing as subject of an object, plus minus with a difference. and But here you work with the functions and it became more interesting for, for, uh, to work with uh, injection, right? We get used to have a services. We want to inject something to our functionality. We will still want to use uh, same patterns as we have used before. So going just with this sample will require you to change the way you think and how you use Angular. So that's a good cool thing to try, but just be warned. Back to features integrations. Uh, using services or injection tokens to provide feature implementation is nothing new, obviously. Dependency injection allow us to gracefully handle most of cross dependencies and injection issues. But how we'll mix it with our components and how bind value properties to some functions. So what are our implementation requirements? Minimal or zero private Angular API usage. Performance, of course, and use cases coverage, and something to come. So as of uh, reasons to have a methods or being uh, methods to your uh, component, there are actually not so many. Uh, because most of the methods you have on your component is something you want to use, for example, from your template. Uh, for example, to allow a user to trigger an action from a component template. And obviously, one of the options you have here is uh, simply 
used helper methods like bean methods here is a sample of uh, a helper method which removes the boilerplate of binding between uh, methods provided by a service and methods declared on your component. So you have declaration of method, but it's empty while service provides an implementation and you're able to reuse it with almost no boilerplate. Funny part here is that this setup could be called from inside the component, which is right approach, or you could have a service which injects the services as some Angular developers love to do. As of uh, other approach, uh, as a reason to uh, have a message on the component, uh, or like methods in these schemes like uh, getter setter, but it's still uh, something to, which will be called as a function internally. So you, if you do some calculations on a get, this is performance heavy operation. If you do that on a set, basically you're reacting to a property change from a template or um, whatever other reason it's changed, uh, by example, set interval. And again, this code is requires you to have one private property and a couple of things on top of it, which is plus minus boilerplate. Here we have on set helper method, which you could like imagine how it works, and two options how it could be implemented. So whenever you need that setter and you try to avoid this boilerplate, you should be able to do that almost a vine liner. Uh, other reason for us to have some methods is react on change. Obviously, here key is type check. So one, one of the important things when you develop such approach is that it's compile time checked. Even if it's using like name of a property as a string, it still should be compile time checked. Thanks God we are leaving times of the TypeScript and this is easily possible. Right, so on change you can do simple things like on set just to, you know, convert string value to number, uh, or calculate some additional value like in second line, or more complicated things uh, which uh, react to when a couple of properties have changed at the same time, or whatever reason. This is something like a RigJS scan or uh, similar to things like computed properties in Mobix or Vue or similar um, state management solution. Obviously, that's uh, one of the ways to reduce the boilerplate uh, code. And of course, uh, the things which I really, really don't love, when we have observables as a part of the component API, which later is used in template with async pipe which is, sounds like a nice idea, but it never was. It makes it simpler to use uh, something which from async nature inside of our um, templates, but it does not make it a good idea in general. So, and for example, bind property for any observable, any subject, whatever we have, it has a snapshot. And only this snapshot will be actually displayed in the template or HTML because HTML is a static. So why not to use this bind, for example, a property thing, which could do uh, more complicated beans. Uh, for example, uh, on the first and second things, what is happening here that Whenever ID property has changed, so you have a component with input ID or property ID, whatsoever doesn't important. Whenever it change, it actually triggers a fetch to the backend with this ID. Then when you have response, uh, you have a static response, right? And the status of this response itself. And you're able to bin the results to your uh, component. Imagine doing the same thing uh, with the way how you do that. I could bet that would be not four lines of code. That will be a lot of boilerplate as usually, unfortunately, because I do the same things. So, and uh, one of the samples uh, I have, I did cut it a bit down to lesser amount of the screens, but gathering all of those ideas we discussed before in something more real life. For example, when we have to select country, then select state, and then select the city name. 
and your component will have something like this because you will have input property to search. When you press like country name, you start to enter it. Then you go has a fetch. That fetch returns you an object where it has full name, ID, and the list. Because when you pull that, you have to store the list of the, for example, countries. And you will be using I think to show those observables and some plus minus primitive code how you pull this data as a method. In terms of view composition API, as a clear approach. Uh, it will have a similar structure. You can, you can see here a reactive um, object, which make it observable. You see computed properties, which is interesting thing because they work. Uh, there are two options like implicit or explicit uh, reaction on some on some change. In this case, it's implicit. So com you see that computed property doesn't actually know which property has changed, and that's some. Um, magic behind the curtains which happens here in order to make this work so how can it be in our case uh, our component eventually at the end of the day will look like this so you have uh, three three classes with properties and three services which has a behavior mm, that's it plus minus if two Look inside of one of those those setups. Uh, basically, how that works inside that you have a country name. When country name change, you run fetch by name, and then you bind the result to the list of countries and maybe something additional, like currently selected country. And uh, obviously, that will reduce amount of the boilerplate code and it sounds like a set of the helper methods it is so basically that's doesn't even new paradigm of the development but it's much simpler way with much lesser efforts uh, to produce readable maintainable and extendable piece of a code uh, while i'm really excited about it I had to switch to the model federation and I really hope and actually working on uh, currently, for example, and in Jigs Bootstrap, we have a support for Bootstrap 3, Bootstrap 4, and now Bootstrap 5 is in beta. So we need to add third set of templates. And I don't want to repeat all of the code in templates, for example. I don't want to repeat all of the components code. So obviously, I use lazy ways in order to provide a new set of components which are uh, providing me functionality without boilerplate. I am lazy developer. Sometimes it's a good thing to have. So uh, whatever you do, <clears throat> don't try to like never try to make things perfectly from the first try. Make it work, then make it pretty. So whenever I'm trying to work uh, through the composition API, I said something new to me too. So uh, I'm doing it as I get used to, and then just removing the boilerplate code when it works as, I, as, mm, as expected. Uh, you know, after all of this, try to think about how it could change, for example, Angular CDK in your libraries or your applications, how much boilerplate code you can reduce. Uh, try to remember those cases when you need, for example, type ahead, but uh, with, a bit, with a bit different match behavior when you need to copy paste all the type ahead from somewhere and then implement inside of it uh, your special behavior, uh, which happens a lot actually. And with this approach, um, you just need to provide impl different implementation from one of the services which is used in that type ahead, and you will have a new behavior which is awesome. Uh, of course, testing feature functionality could be completed, isolated from view. <clears throat> so on this approach, uh, your behavior is mostly not related to the template. As far as you remember, when I was showing several um, parts of the split, how you can split uh, checkbox, only one uh, of it was actually showing properties which will be used in a template. So that's like one fifth of all of the, all of the, your inputs or like uh, API surface, which you actually have to test with the component itself. And 
I would say that's the most of the things I would love to share with you today. So thank you for your attention. And that's all, folks. And of course, you will be able to find the reference list up here in presentation, the end slide, because uh, there are a lot of great work which was done before me. And I would love to uh, give you credit for it for folks who did a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much for presentation, Dmitry. Let's see what questions do we have. Please, you are more than welcome to write down questions and I'll ask them for you. And also we have extra present from our sponsor, Ducks, the nice cabin luggage bag for the best question. So don't be shy. You can ask again any language you want, English, Russian, or Ukrainian. For Dmitry, it shouldn't be a challenge. <laughs> a bit of Deutsch and Spanish too. <laughs> okay. It's quite a hard topic just to you know get through. Hopefully, when it will become more popular, it will be easier to, um, you know, have it and uh, ask questions. So it's fine. Yeah, well, this is definitely a high level and hard topic. I understand the beat because I, I am well prepared. We already discussed it before. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, something around for a couple of years, but uh, like trying to find the right way uh, you know to make um, complicated things to simplify those most it's the hardest thing of our job obviously and to remove the boilerplate is something um, everybody strives to do yeah and the approach presented as you already said several times it's something completely different to angular well after first look yeah, it's a bit different, but mostly is the angular way. Minus some parts, mostly angular. More of it, some of this approach, like mixing base classes and some other tools already used in material, but you know, it's a long road ahead in order to use it fully. Okay, good. I see we have some questions. So I'll just put it on the screen. <laughs> To the bound to the template, we need special directive. Uh, so uh, rev zero is something from ng effect, which I would not suggest to use like right away. Okay, so this is the same way how you would use a uh, subject from a number. So rev zero has a value on that. So we will have to use property dot value and you will have that thing in your template. In view, it's this provided by uh, the compiler itself. In Angular, you will have to go to that approach when you have, you make an observable uh, primitive value and then you have to actually listen for that value. Thanks, Dmitry, for a question. Okay, <laughs> one, more, one more from Dmitry. Uh, does it work with Angular language service? To some degree, this is part of the hacks which I was mentioning. So what does uh, Material Team currently? It uh, uses input metadata property in component metadata, for example. Yes, in order to provide the list of the things. So yes, it's compatible uh, at some, to some degree. Uh, but again, mm, Angular is able to and comprehend one level of extending, uh, for example, directive. It has a special plugin for a component, and at time of uh, compilation time, it's able to um, inherit the metadata too. So when you have a component and you inherit of another one, uh, Angular language service plugin is able to cover it like 100% like a native one. If you do more than one nesting, like this third 
will most likely be lost if you have a mixture and then you extend it till up to some degree it's like some parts will be covered some not so you will see the properties but uh, you will see the documentation for those properties because those go from TypeScript and uh, those works. Will you be able to fully comprehend and learn language service plugin? No, because the features will truly relate on currently view engine or later on uh, whenever it will be available Angular language service, which is based on Ivy, some parts will be missing. But that's not a big deal because uh, names, types, documentation will be available on the template through the Angular language service. How well is the time for your question? I think it is good. Thank you. And one more question from Vitaly. So, what's the difference between the composition and composition with dependency injection? Because all the stuff can be implemented with composition services and use the dependency injection of Angular. Uh, you mean like in G, hopefully, if I'm correct, uh, you compare NG effects? with uh, the way how I do propose things. And in GFX, you basically write in the pure functions. So I would not say that you're able to actually use um, dependency injections the same way you would use the services. Obviously, you can push inside injector and use that injector with some types in order to pull some additional services. That's true, uh, but you should remember that injector on its own is not compatible to all of the other things which you can do through uh, decorators to the properties on the constructor or other way around. So it's almost there, but not the way how you usually do the things. Okay, good. And one more question from Iwan. It's like, for, for, for messages, it's difficult to put on the screen, but that was the previous one for about maintainability and basically the question itself. Could you already, may, maybe you already face some problems with your team and new teammates? Uh, not sure how that related to the topic. Uh, like, let's uh, yeah, try yeah, to yeah, answer yeah, yeah, yeah. the previous part yeah. of it. So it's. Oh, okay. That's um, that's not even a part of um, I would say any. It's like a part of any approach which you want to scale. Uh, whenever whenever you have some like team wide or product related context, your best practices or your agreement to respect some boundaries. Uh, that obviously requires some onboarding and education of the team, right? Uh, mostly, if you have uh, the old code written, it has it doesn't like approach I use. One of the things I needed um, it's because of its simplicity. So, and the onboarding itself is not a big deal. It's run just several helper methods, which just removes the boilerplate mostly, and how you split things. Uh, the couple of tricks, obviously, is inputs, outputs, and uh, that in empty uh, directive. But uh, like, if you need to push, uh, add a couple of properties and to see where it came from, uh, that's uh, something you could do, for example, through Visual Studio Code just by control click on the name, it will lead you to proper class. So, could be issues if you don't have onboarding. If you have onboarding to how you develop things, uh, should be fine, hopefully. Okay, good, good. I think we have all the questions, so now you need to select the best, that you, that your favorite one. Uh, second question of the Dmitry, could you show me to me again? Yes, sure. Yeah, that's something I didn't thought too much, but after this question, I will have to recheck it again. Uh, from my experience, uh, that's something which was 
quite a hard to remember and trying to imagine how to work with uh, properties related to the view engine and how language service does work. So I would prefer to choose this question. Okay, cool. Thank you. So Dmitry, please contact me to get the nice present from Dax. And uh, Dmitry, our speaker, Dmitry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting and high level high-level experiments. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Have a nice day. Two. Okay, and we are moving to our... Uh...